Hello and welcome to an Off The Bar special as we bring you some of the best bits from our homely little show set here in the Alexander Public House in the leafy surroundings of Weybridge. The regulars amongst you will know that the first series ran a couple of years ago and we've trawled through all 34 episodes of that series, married them up with the best bits from this series so far to bring you what we think is half an hour of decent TV. Uh, for those of you who aren't regulars, and that could be painful, uh, here's a whistle-stop tour of series one. So here we are, Leon, standing in a... I made you a star. I mean, I think we need to get that uh, out, of, out in the open um, you, on you, goals on Sunday. You maybe. were on there, yeah. But would you believe, Matthew, how long that was? I don't know. I'm 38 now, so what, that was 14. You know, I'm 34 now. But you announced uh, recently... <laughs> you're... Shut up. No, uh, it's fine. I'm 20. Are you? Yeah. You've taken off the same number of years. No, you haven't done it. So I'm welcome. Girls doing football. Well, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of them doing it nowadays. You're a bit of a dinosaur, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and Has first been. and last time you're going to be on. She's fragrant, she's glamorous and bubbly, and she's very definitely outspoken. OK, we'll move on to Stoke against Hull. Um, everybody's waiting for Hull to nosedive. Nosedive? <laughs> you did it, not Thank me. You. Thank you. Well, I thought it was, was well-placed, by the way. The absolutely amazing what would go on. So you could see how people would be so... Somebody is phoning in to say I, you've got I, a I great idea the, there. I turn the damn thing off, <laughs> I, 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 I turn the <laughs> thing off. <laughs> Hello. And it's so true what you're saying. Now, what I'm going to do, we are going to have this debate about football and rugby uh, and, the, and the relative merits uh, in part two. And I'm just going to stand up and explain why that most of that debate, now you stand up, most of that debate... I'm stuck under the table. Here we go. ...will be uh, conducted by Mr <laughs> Gale. Tony Gale, the uh, fat bloke over there, has asked, um, he wants to go on holiday to Sardinia. Can you recommend a place? No, 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 no. People like uh, like him, they're not allowed to come to Sardinia. Uh, our place is a serious place. <laughs> <laughs> he is fat though, isn't he? He is really fat. <laughs> <laughs> It's not every day that one of the most famous actors in British, not to mention world cinema, pops in for a bit of a chat. He's revered in Hollywood and here as the daddy. And Ray Winston was in the mood to have some fun when he came to call. After all, it was his birthday. Ray, I suspect this is going to be the longest five minutes of my life. Um, you want to talk about football, I want to talk about the movies, and I'm first. I, I just think it's incredible that you, know, you were working with, with, you know, as normal as you are, sort of, really? with people like Jack Nicholson <laughs> and Anthony Hopkins and directors like Spielberg and Scorsese. Are they ordinary people? Well, I've done a film called Last Orders when I, when I was young. Before I worked with, I've worked with some really good people, and I worked with David Emmons and Michael Caine and Oskins and Tom Courtney and Adam Mirren. And the first thing you, you think about is that's fantastic. I've been watching them since I was ki a kid, you know? And then a fear comes in because you want them to live up to your expectations. You want them to be really good people. And I must say, they were. They were, they were fabulous. And the best times I've ever had were sitting in this car, because it was all about a journey to Margate and that, and listening to the stories, not film stories, but just stories about people's lives and having a laugh with them. So when you realise, when you end up working with when you go and turn up to do a day's work with uh, Jack Nicholson or DiCaprio or whoever it is, that they're just kids who go to work or people who go to work. And uh, like what you do, like what I do, like if you've got to drive a cab, you know, everyone's got to be um, kind of looked at for the job that they do, you know, and you've got to enjoy that. So I've been pretty lucky in that way that I had a good blood in with the Michael Caines and the Bob Hoskins and all that, who are to me are the biggest stars that you'll ever meet in your life, you know. And yet you, you, you still a fan or oh, still a fan of West Ham and of people like him. Who, yeah, you know, what about surely... when you meet your footballing heroes? <laughs> There's none here, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know he got nicked once? Tony got nicked for breaking into a pound note. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, yeah, honestly, he was let off because it was his first offence. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, Les is an hero of mine because he missed the, uh, he missed the 75 final, you know, and he's still wearing a suit. But, um, but yeah, um, that, my, that's my era, you know, the Ellen Devonshire, the Tony Gales, uh, the Jeff Hurst, the Bobby Moores. And I was lucky enough to meet and play against Bobby Moore at Wembley but, um, and meet him after when he was very ill. I mean, it, that was a man to me who was, if, if I had any heroes, it was Bobby Moore. Because everyone talks about the East End and being full of gangsters and all that, it's all we're famous for. And then all of a sudden you, you come across a man like Bobby Moore who actually done more for the East End, forget about the football, but the image of the East End, of a gentleman 
Uh, and I, I think uh, I'm very proud to have met him and, and to have known him. And that goes for, uh, and all jokes aside, Tony, yourself. <laughs> right? No, but seriously, and because when I was a kid growing up, that's, that, they're the players we used to go and watch, you know, the Paul Goddards, the, the, the Little Allens. But, but going back to Moro, he was yeah. footballing royalty, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, but he earned that right, I yeah. think. You know, I, and I remember, I remember when he died and they had the, uh, on the gates, the flowers on the gates outside Upton Park. And, I, and I, I, I was driving towards the ground to go and have a look at it. And I turned around, I went home. And I, and I thought, I don't want to see that. I want to remember him as he was. It's everybody's yeah. kind of choice in a way, you know. But to me, um, it was more than just the football with Bobby Moore. If they, you know, they say a player is not bigger than the club. I remember when he played for Fulham in the final. And I wouldn't have minded getting beat that day by Fulham, purely because it was Bobby Moore playing for Fulham and that's no disrespect to Fulham but I think if there was anyone ever bigger than the club then it, and without trying to be bigger than the club it probably was Bobby Moore you know. We're talking about the FA Cup um, West Ham were back in the cup in 91 yeah. and were that close to get into the final when there was a very controversial incident involving some in very tight shorts yeah. getting himself sent off. Yeah, he did, and I, I, I don't think he was intelligent enough to bring the guy down on purpose. <laughs> but if you, if you see that, it, I mean, we played a fabulous night on the Forest side at the time, uh, Brian Clough. I, I, yeah. I remember the day really well, you know, uh, and the, the reaction of the supporters at the end when they were cheering Clough. They were actually clapping Clough, and it was a kind of little pipe. I'm sure it was a few rounds outside the ground after. <laughs> but um, it, we, we lost to an absolutely fabulous Forest side who got beat by Tottenham in the final, if I remember rightly. Um, but... It was kind of half a liberty. He was the last man, but the centre forward done exactly what a centre forward should do. He went across the defender, you know, and t and kind of went across Tony's path. And it was a gut for him to be sent off. Uh, it was a gut for us because we all wanted to kill him at the time. But what do you know about football anyway? Well, a little bit more than you, that's for sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to get sent off, at least hit him. <laughs> Well, we haven't spent all our time in the pub. In fact, one of us spent so much time out of it that he kidded himself he could become fit enough to become the oldest player in the Football League. At the age of 43, David Marable bid £3,000 in a charity auction to become Southend United's oldest player. This was his first day at pre-season. Money is tight in the lower leagues. At Southend, they're cutting back on two fronts, changing rooms, and transfers. 43-year-old David Marable is the oldest registered player in the league. He cost nothing and he's about to prove why. It's quite brave but my mum always said I'd make it and uh, she believed in me and we got there. Manager Steve Tilson admits hiring a middle-aged playmaker is a gamble. Bearing in mind that some of your players' fathers went to school with him, uh, do you think they'll look up to him? Yeah, they may do, depending on how well he does, to be honest. Um, obviously, if he, uh, if he doesn't do the business, he'll be getting a bit of stick. What about fitness, though? He, he appears to lack that. Well, that's, you know, that's my one concern at the moment. Looking at the weight side of it, he probably needs to do a bit of running, a bit, a bit of stamina work, and lose probably seven or eight pounds. How's he going to do that when his staple <laughs> diet is lager? Probably cutting down from eight pints a night to, to a pint would... would my help. Keeping up his test, the older player's fitness. Just listen in on this finely tuned body. When you get past the, the five minute mark, do you find fitness is called into question? Yeah, the two minute mark kind of kicks in a bit, really. <laughs> we need to get him fit. You know, I think it's going to be a good six or seven weeks until he's fit enough to, to be able to, to compete at this level. For now, Marable trains alone. Penalties without too long a run-up are a speciality. Tilly keeps, you know, telling me he's going to play me in the pre-seasons, and then he, the phone doesn't ring. But I think it could be the last couple of minutes in the last game of the season when there's nothing to play for, really. Like I say, we've got a young side, and experience can play a big part. Um, and I say, hopefully, you know, he, he can bring that experience and, and help us on the on the park. Marable is determined to repay his manager's faith. He plans on trapping a ball on his neck sometime in the next five years. If you got an offer for him, would you take it? Depends on the offer. You know, if, if we get a decent offer, then it, it might be worth taking. 50 pence? I don't think they want to get rid of me. I'm a local boy. You know, it's be bad publicity for them. They need all the publicity they can get, these boys. 
at least the older player can handle the odd tricky question from the press. Who would you compare yourself with uh, in the modern game? Do you know much about the modern game? Modern game? Probably the bloke out of that John Smith's advert, to be honest with you. And, and why have you got that ball up your shirt? <laughs> David Marable, so near and yet so far. But he did get himself a gig. He's found himself a job as a tester in a lager laboratory. That's it for part one, but there's plenty more in part two, so stay around for a couple of minutes. Welcome back to our review of Off the Bar so far. Now, referees rarely get a good press, and having seen some of them in action, that's hardly surprising. But one man in black, Dermot Gallagher, has become a friend to this programme. He's refereed an under-20s World Cup final, countless Premier League games, and every domestic cup final. Even so, we thought it was about time we sent Dermot back to square one, to the Banbury Sunday League First Division, in fact, and to a vital game for the Banbury Spurs. This is how Dermot and the mud got on. Dermot Gallagher has gone back to his roots. No, not his follicles, but Sunday morning football. Here in Banbury, the lawnmowers also provide the fertiliser. Note the wheelbarrow. While Dermot is going live, wearing a microphone so we can hear what he really thinks about the game. And on the touchline, two of Banbury's foremost television commentators are there to give the ref a fair and honest assessment. Who's the ref? Some local lad, I think. Not done many games, to be honest, this season, so I'm worried he'll tire in the second half. Big occasion, muddy pitch, time of year. This is grassroots football. This is where it's all done. It certainly is. Dermot's looking over nervously now, he's wondering what we're saying about him. You know, refereeing's a difficult job. All this respect, Mark, that I'm not, not too sure it's working at the minute. In this sort of league, it depends who you're playing against. But I would say yes, respect has definitely gone up. Our referee, you play. They should have never got rid of me. I make the decisions. I didn't give anything. I can see a call up next week. Liverpool, Chelsea, Dan. I just said it's not a pass, that's all I said. I didn't say it was. We need you. What did I give? Uh, I gave nothing. I still got it. I didn't even know what you had to go for. I'm going to go, yeah. So, no goals as yet. I doubt this is going to be pay per view, to be honest. Oh, referee, that's gone the wrong way there, Dermot. Look at that. You get six out of ten for that arm raise, that's quality. Absolutely textbook. There was a bit of arm flapping earlier from him, which I wasn't too sure about. Look, he's looking for his hair again. Yep, there we go, another little scratch. If none of these can score, I'm going to do it, I tell you, I'm going to do it. Oh, that's rubbish. What's he doing? Hey, ref, come on! And Dermot gives nothing. Yeah. Oh, I've had enough of this. Give it to me. Give it to me. I've had enough of this. Boys. Advantage. It's a, it's a long programme, it's not about today and tomorrow, it's about an ongoing thing and um, the message is getting through and you know the, the times when referees have been handed down and chased around the park are few and far between at the moment. <laughs> Dermot Gallagher proving that some referees can actually play a bit, although he, me, no one else actually knows where that yellow card came from. Now, someone who can give Ray Winston a run for his money when it comes to vying for the title Britain's best-loved actor is James Nesbitt. He started his career with the ITV hit series Cold Feet. Since then, he went down to superb productions like Bloody Sunday, and now his name is a simple green light for any director hoping to have a complete money spin-up, which is why it was an absolute pleasure to welcome Jimmy to our bar. If this were Desert Island Discs, a show I'm unlikely ever to host, um, which would you choose as, as your one prize? Would it be Coleraine or Manchester United? I'm very, a, a, a strong supporter of Irish League football. I think it's the 
a heartbeat to a town, and uh, it's important to be supported. But United are, you know, cut me and like everyone, I bleed red. But people say that Eamon Holmes is a, a very similar disposition about Manchester United. I'm not sure about what life is like in Northern Ireland, but it is red or red, isn't it? No, well, listen, when I grew up, it was, uh, you know, I was, I was born a wee bit after Eamon. Um, <laughs> and he's actually quite a different disposition to me. Uh, but, uh, you know, Leeds were a huge team, Arsenal. I mean, United, I started supporting in 69, so I had 21 years of them, um, not winning anything. But what's interesting about the United players, you know, if you look at what, whatever people say about Ferguson, if you look at Giggs, Neville, Scores, they've stayed with the man, they adore the man, because he respects them, and they respect him. And... Uh, there is a loyalty still attached to football, irrespective of the money, and I think United is actually quite a, a good uh, illustration of that. All right, moving on to uh, TV and stuff. Cold Feet, I presume, is where it all started, or was there a little yeah, bit before a, that? I worked a good bit before that. Uh, I mean, I worked the minute I left drama school, I was very lucky. Um, but I suppose in terms of a public awareness and, and doors being opened, Cold Feet unquestionably was very helpful. You're one of the most often seen faces on TV, one of the most popular faces on TV. Is that luck or is that application on your part? I think it's both. I think it's a good question. I mean, I think you have to be lucky uh, to work. I mean, I was around at the right time. I got involved in the right shows. But, but I also had a bit of a work ethic thing. You know, I, I, I spent years kind of laughing off the notion that I was an actor and not because I was worried that people would think it's not a really serious job. And I suppose I didn't. But I've worked very hard at it and I enjoy it. I mean, I'm, I'm in one of those lucky positions like yourself. I enjoy what I do. This is, uh, remember Shoot magazine, they'd ask questions like oh, this. Yeah. Uh, what would you rather have been? Georgie Best or what you are today? Georgie Best in a heartbeat. Georgie Best for a second. Imagine having that talent, those looks, that life, you know. People are too down on George, I think, you know, the legacy of George. George is a footballer, something to Tony Gale there, but before we started the programme, and um, he was saying, you know, I mean, you don't beat George. Um, talking of downers, uh, for those people like me who enjoyed Cold Feet, we saw Bloody Sunday. Yeah. When I say it down, it was a serious side of you yeah, that yeah. we hadn't expected. Turned things around a bit, didn't it? No, it had a big impact, not only professionally, uh, but I think also just in terms of personally, it made me look a wee bit more closely at where I come from. I think it was an important film. I think it was a good film, but, um, you know, uh, it had a serious side to it. But every job you do has presents its own challenges, but that I think it had an impact on me more than anything else. And you, you return to the Troubles with uh, your latest work. Yeah, uh, Five Minutes of Heaven uh, is a film I did with Liam Neeson on Sunday night at 9 o'clock on BBC Two. Uh, and it, it, it's about a real uh, event that happened in 1975. 17-year-old boy played by Liam Neeson joined the loyalist paramilitaries, shot a random Catholic called Jim Griffin. I play his brother, who was 11-year-old, and witnessed it. And it's a fictionalised account about what happens if they would meet. I'd like to learn why it is that you haven't done what I mean, a former guest on this programme, Ray Winston, did, a, a nip across to Hollywood and make megabucks. Well, you can make a lot of money here, actually. Uh, not that I have, obviously, uh, Mr Taxman. Um, <laughs> I've been very comfortable with the, the work I've been doing here, the, the challenges I've been presented with. I mean, Ray's done, you know, Ray's the king, though. I mean, there's, there's only one Ray Winston, there's plenty of me. And uh, I think I'd, you know, if the opportunity arose, uh, I, I would go. But it's a big thing to uplift a family and go and sit beside a pool for six months waiting to get a job in a film that's not that good with an accent I can't do. Not that Ray has done that. Uh, I mean, he's, as I say, the king. But I'm happy to work anywhere, you know. I'll work, uh, oh, look, I've come here for the day. <laughs> uh, we're very grateful. That sounded far too smooth. Jim, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you, you very too, much. Matt. Getting interviews with modern-day footballers is about as easy as getting Tony Gale to open his wallet at this bar. But Liverpool impressionist Darren Farley saved us the bother of meeting any of the Liverpool team by, well, impersonating all of them. At the time, he was particularly vexed by a penalty controversy involving Steven Gerrard. Um, I think I did. Um, obviously, you know, I think there was contact. Uh, but, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we deserved the points out of the game. Um, Obviously, they're a good side and they've got good players, but um, yeah, I think we should we should um, keep our heads held high. I think we deserve the points out of it. And, um, OK, maybe maybe it weren't clear as crystal, but, um, you know, we got the pen and sometimes you get the luck, don't you? Jamie, what was your view? Well, you know, you, you know, we've had decisions against us, you know, our sell the season. I mean, you know, you've got to think about it, you know. 
these things happen, you know what I mean? We're disappointing to concede the goal, you know, circumstances. But, you know, there's not really much more you can do than just accept it. You know, we got the penalty, Steve, he's sucked it away, so I mean, no more you can say than that, you know? Um, the manager, I mean, presumably you thought it was a penalty. Okay, we are talking with Gerard. You know he's not a diver, okay? You know the problem because he works hard for the team. But we were talking and you know he works hard. The problem, the problem is you have the penalty. We have had decisions against those decisions. Okay, we know we have to concentrate. The mentality of the squad is okay and you can keep working hard to get the result you need, for sure. Well, sometimes we actually have to get the players. And as I said, it's not very easy. In fact, we had to fly all the way to Barbados to a Legends tournament to meet Ian Dowie and Alan Shearer. They teamed up with Graham Fenton to do a spoof of that famous Fenton the Dog viral. If you haven't seen it, this will make no sense at all. Hello, welcome to Barbados. Second day of the PFA Legends, the semi-finals and finals coming up. I'm here with Ian Dowie, Graham Fenton and Alan Shearer. Alan, who's your money on today? I think it's on the Caribbean All-Stars. They've got pace, they've got power, they've got Fenton? a bit of everything. Fenton! Fenton! Jesus Christ, Fenton! 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 Dowie, Shearer and collected chums proving that sometimes football's not all hard work. And we prove the same thing here, every week on Off The Bar, with our keepy uppy feature. Some are good, some are bad, and some just look good doing it. Okay, I'm not doing it.